Good morning, everyone. Good morning. As I'm hoping all of you know, I'm Jacob. <laughs> you don't know by now, then I don't know where you've been this past six, a little extra than six years. But yes, hopefully. I, I don't know when, nobody knows when. So what time did you get up to drive here? So actually I was, <laughs> so Priscilla's cousin was supposed to have a wedding April 2nd. Well, her father got diagnosed with cancer. So they moved it to yesterday. So I drove in last night after attending a wedding in Bakersfield. So I got here about 1 a.m. this morning. <laughs> so I'm running off of caffeine. That is pretty much <laughs> how this is going to work. <laughs> so you need sleep. I slept a little bit <laughs> with the time change and everything else that doesn't always, you know, add up. But that is pretty regular not sleeping now since, again, later on you will see, I now have a daughter who's three months old. So what is sleep? Really? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> So, I'm going to start with a background about myself. So, I was born in 1993. Yes, yes, it is being recorded. I may edit things out later on that I say just because I can't. No. Um, I was born actually in LA in Harbor City at Kaiser. Um, I was supposed to be born on New Year's Eve, um, but my mom went into labor and the doctor at Kaiser did not want to perform C-sections. So they left my mom in labor for 72 hours. What? I was not born until January 2nd. Yeah, not, not a great way to start. <laughs> so um, my parents are Esther Moretta and Henry Moretta. Um, some of you may know my dad uh, through the theater from either the Armstrong Theater, or he's done lighting here for a few of the adult shows, um, which I'll explain later because that's how I ended up here actually, is uh -huh. through that. Um, and then I also have a brother who is older than me, uh, Justin, and uh, he got married five years ago now, um, moved to Texas, and then now moved to Arizona. And he has uh, my niece and my nephew. So I have a niece who's almost three years old and a nephew who is about nine months. No, 13. He's 13 months. He's older than me. Yeah. Trying to keep track of all the kids everywhere is not, not the best way. <laughs> all right. So early years. He moved to Georgia when I turned two years old because my dad got offered a job at a major hospital in Savannah. Um, so we actually lived in the outskirts uh, in a place called Richmond Hill. Um, I don't know if anybody knows anywhere where that could be because we did it when we moved there because it was literally a small little plantation area off the dirt road off the highway. And when it rained, they would put a flag out there, and my dad just thought, oh, great, they're marking the road when it rains, so we could see. Yeah, no, they're marking the road because it floods and you get stuck. <laughs> so you have to go all the way around. My father did not know that the first time, and he did get stuck. <laughs> so, but 18 months later, they laid off my dad, and we ended up moving back to California. Later on, I found out reason why was because they brought all these people in so the hospital could get certified by the state. And then once they got their certification, they got rid of it. And it was a very, very common practice apparently back in the early 90s. And <laughs> it is illegal. And they, that hospital has now been taken over by the government because of that. <laughs> activities such as that. Um, once we moved back, I was three and a half. Uh, we lived over in Harbor City. Um, and at that time, when I was five years old, I ended up in the hospital for two weeks 
because I had asthma induced bronchitis. So things did not add up well, and they, I ended up in the hospital. Um, luckily, my dad is a respiratory therapist. Um, and so we had all the medical, medical equipment for me to be taken care of prior to uh, leaving the hospital and everything like that, which helped out because even to today, I still have pretty severe asthma, but I have everything to take care of it myself, which is great. <laughs> then we're gonna move into elementary school. So I attended Fern Elementary over in Torrance. Um, we moved there when I was six. Yes, Emily. Um, so that house, um, my dad's parents bought in the late 60s, and it's the yeah. that was more 50. mid 50s. Um, and it's the house that he grew up in, and when my grandparents passed away, we bought it out from the rest of the family. So I used to live over in Torrance, uh, literally three blocks down from the Civic Center. So pretty, pretty nice area. Um, if you've ever heard of Torrance's Armed Forces Day Parade, that was the one day of the year that we never went anywhere because you couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> um, which was actually really nice because my grandfather was uh, ex-army and he was one of the founders of the parade and would mar he marched in it for 40 years before until he could no longer march. And then what he ended up doing was sit in the patio of the house and watch and take part and watch all the kids, mainly. <laughs> um, I'm going to step back here because I'm double duty real quick. <laughs> Got to add people. <laughs> Um, then I had another medical issue that occurred, um, which most of you I'm sure have heard of, but would never hear of it in a fourth grader. How many of you know what shingles is? I was one of eight cases at the time who got shingles in fourth grade. And of course, it was on my face. So this is actually more towards the tail end of it. Um, but it was this whole left side of my face. It was not, not, fun, not fun at all. No, I literally came home from school one day complaining to my mom that it, my face just hurt. And after a day of screaming and agonizing pain, she's like, all right, we're going to the ER. <laughs> Went to the hospital. Doctor comes in and he's like, the only thing this could be is shingles. We got to wait about three days to see if anything appears. Well, two and a half days later, it started appearing and there it was. So not the greatest time for a fourth grader. Um, <laughs> extremely painful. I got to this again. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, so that was one of the concerns that the doctor had when it first started appearing is that it could affect that eye. Um, my left eye has always been my weak eye anyway. <laughs> um, it's been a lazy eye. It's actually grown substantially since I've actually gotten older, which apparently is a rarity in its own. But so I like your hair. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I always had my widow's peak. <laughs> I'm starting to lose it now, but you know. <laughs> at least I'm not as bad as my brother. My brother's starting to go bald, so that's. <laughs> um, so after that, middle school, I went to Madrona Middle School over in Torrance on Madrona Avenue, go figure, right across from the Torrance Mall or the Long Mall as it is. Oh. It is not the same mall that I grew up with, <laughs> so. Uh, one of the big things in middle school is uh, I got into flag football. So I played flag football, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. 
And then the other big sport I actually started doing a lot of was bowling. And I was actually fairly decent at it. So um, I started in a junior league over at the bowling alley off of Western. Uh, it used to be called Bowladrome a long time ago. I don't even know the name of it now because it keeps getting bought out and changed over. Yeah. <laughs> so I started there um, in my heyday. Uh, my bowling average was 226. Um, that pretty much carried most of the end of middle school through high school um, until I ended up blowing out my left kneecap because I did not have proper shoes and I never thought anything else of it because, well, I was young and stupid at the time. So, <laughs> um, but my junior year, as you can see in this picture here, uh, the upper right is me, of course. Upper left is my best friend, Nathan. Bottom right is our friend, JR. And then bottom left, uh, her name is Caitlin Corwin. And this tournament we went to out in Downey. Uh, it was the first big tournament that I went to by myself because I was now able to drive. So I drove me my, and my two friends out there. And our averages at the time, mine was roughly 200. Everybody else's was 180 to 170, and Kaylin's was about 120, which isn't bad. And for a tournament, it's actually really good because then it balances out if you know anything about bowling with handicaps and all that stuff. Well, we were having such a blast, and my best friend Nathan is a little psychotic um, and likes to be really loud. But he had a good reason. All of us, all four of us, were bowling in the 220 range that tournament. And even Kayla, whose average was about 110, 115, was bowling over 200. It was the first time she had ever hit over 200. And so we almost got kicked out <laughs> because we were having teams on the other side of the bowling alley complaining about hearing us being too loud. Now, if you've ever been in a bowling alley with any, you know, substantial amount, usually you can't hear anything anyway. That is how loud we were. <laughs> we were above everything else. Um, but that was the proud heyday. The um, following year, um, I actually was offered to go on the Junior Olympics for bowling. Um, I got the offer a month later, I blew out my head. So that did not go anywhere. Um, but in the meantime, I was doing tournaments. Um, they used to be called the Pepsi tournaments because it was sponsored by Pepsi. Um, and because we were minors, we couldn't play for cash prizes. Um, but what they did is you played for scholarships. So it worked out well because my first year and a half of college was paid for by my bully. So, which worked out nice. Then we come to the high school. Um, I played football freshman year of high school, and I only played freshman year of high school uh, because I ended up getting a lower back injury. I ended up um, cracking my tailbone, uh, amongst other things that happened, which were not in favor, so I played for only one year and decided all right, I prefer not to be, you know, broken down so much. I'm going to figure something else out. Uh, one other thing that occurred at that time is all through elementary, middle school, and going into my freshman year of high school, I was actually in special needs classes. Because in elementary school, they diagnosed me with uh, audio processing. So it means you could tell me something and I would get every third word, every fourth word. I couldn't process as fast as somebody would speak. So I was assigned to special needs school or special need classes going all the way through my freshman year of high school. 
got into my freshman year of high school and I was, again, assigned to a special needs class. First day of class, or no, it was about second week of class, my teacher, uh, I can still remember her name, Ms. came up to me and asked, why are you in this class? You were running straight A's. I checked your middle school grades. You were a 4.0 kid. Why are you here? My response was, the school put me here. What, what do you want me to do? <laughs> She's like, all right, well, you know what? We're going we're gonna to figure this out because you really don't need this class. Like, whatever they diagnosed you with before, you're obviously have adapted to overcome it or whatnot, but you don't need to be in here. So the only other class, well, there was two classes that were available in the same time slot that I could get into. One was dance. That wasn't going to happen. <laughs> the second one would change my life forever, which was TV and video production. So I was the only freshman who was in this class because it was only offered to sophomore through senior. So this started actually my career doing TV and video broadcasting and film edit. So this is where all of this started. All the AV stuff sort of stemmed from my high school. Um, so my freshman year, I took TV production. Sophomore year, I took TV production again because I really enjoyed it and wanted to get more in depth. Junior year, they offered me to take TV and video production. And most people are like, well, isn't that the same thing? No, T broadcasting for TV and doing videos are entirely different sets, which is where I get my background. TV production is for live, live broadcasting, live feeds, everything live, you have to work on the spot. Where video, you have four or five months to edit the film and make sure it looks nice. <laughs> and you have to do all the storyboarding and all the writing and everything else. So that kickstarted everything there. Junior year, I was assigned to do the school's baccalaureate slideshow. So for the slideshow, it's supposed to be 25 to 30 minutes. So our slideshow here at the annual meeting is anywhere between seven and nine. So the school slideshow is a lot longer and I don't know all the pictures. I have to go get the pictures from the kids in the photo clubs. Not the funniest thing. But junior year, I had help my professor, professor well, my teacher at the time, um, would put me in contact with the teacher who was in charge of all the photo clubs, and there was a lot more help. Well, see, the end of that year, my teacher had his first child. So senior year came, and I took TV production again because I wanted to. First day of class, he walks in and he says, here, you're doing everything for the slideshow this year. I don't want to see anything. <laughs> I'm like, oh, great. Okay. So I ended up doing our entire senior slideshow for my senior year. Um, I was able to recruit a few kids in the class to help me do editing, but about 90% of the work was done by me, which is where a lot of my film editing skills came from. Um, at the time, we were using what's called Final Cut Pro 7. Um, when I first started here, we were talking about different editing programs, and you guys here have Final Cut Pro 10, which is so much better. Uh, but I'm not going to go too far into that. Uh, so after I graduated my senior year, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Uh, I was really good at film editing. I was good at TV broadcasting. I knew a number of the kids from prior years who went into that for a living. I, after talking to them, realized I could not do that. Because I can't sit at a desk eight hours a day staring at a screen. I would go insane. <laughs> um, so my entire young life, <laughs> I always wanted to be a police officer ever since the third grade. When we had an officer come and visit the class and stuff, that was my goal. So that's what I decided to do once I got into college. And it changes a lot. <laughs> Just, this is my first vehicle. Um, was a 1980 Toyota pickup truck that was manual transmission um, that my dad had customized for off-roading. 
The reason why I bring this up, you will know in a few seconds. So in college, I first decided to attend El Camino College. I was the one that they talk about who was the idiot and didn't see a counselor before I went. <laughs> so instead of being at a JC for two years, I ended up being there for four years because my first year of schooling didn't count towards anything because all the classes I took didn't transfer and, and they didn't count towards a degree. So it was, you know, a little rough, but at the same time, I actually didn't mind because to today, I still remember more about my criminal justice classes that I took that first year than anything else. <laughs> so, um, especially the one class that I took was uh, drug and narcotics. And there was a saying that he used to teach us, it's called chips up and down. So cannabis, hallucinogens, inhalants, PCP, and central nervous system stimulants. And an arrow pointing up. Why? Because anybody who's on any of those, their heart rate increases, their um, body temperature increases, and their pupils uh, dilate. Then you have down, DN, sexual nervous system de depressants and narcotic analgesics, and those do the exact opposite. So that is the easiest way to tell what somebody's it gives you at least a broader category of what drug they're on. So, and yet I still remember that almost 10 years later, or more than 10 years later. <laughs> so, they were great classes. Also, in my first year at El Camino, I met Priscilla. And as all of you know, I am now married to her. <laughs> but this is what she looked like when I first started. Yeah. So, yeah. Little crazy, but you know, hey. <laughs> um, we actually met at her college. Uh, she attended Pacific, uh, Azusa Pacific University. And so the commuting thing has always been sort of part of my life. <laughs> I used to drive out there every weekend to go visit her, um, which after this trip, I had a Ford F-150. So my parents were not exactly happy about me driving to Azusa back every weekend because they paid for my gas. So, <laughs> but it is what it is. Um, after attending El Camino, I decided to continue my degree in criminal justice and I transferred to Cal State University Dominguez Hills. Um, I transferred to CSU Dominguez Hills. Over in uh, Carson, yeah, Carson. You know, going there for you know five years, you'd think you'd still remember where the school is. But <laughs> um, I graduated with my bachelor's in science in criminal justice administration, and after talking to a number of professors and stuff, I was split on what to do. I still wanted to become a police officer and was thinking about going to the academy. Well, after talking to a number of officers and recruiters, I decided it was not going to work because I would never pass, well, I could pass the physical, but I would never get hired by the department because I have that lower back injury from freshman year of high school playing football. And because of that, it would impede me being able to do certain parts of the job as a police officer, which According to government regulations, they can't deny you because of medical, but also in law enforcement, if you don't disclose an injury that can repeat your job, then you committed a felony crime and you go to prison. So I'm like, okay, we're not gonna risk that. That is not gonna work. So then it started coming down to, well, what else can I do now with my degree? Because police officers out of the question. So a number of um, professors that I talked to were like, well, have you looked at probation or working with youth? Because that is what I had done most of my life, um, which I'll explain in a minute. And it sounded great. I was all gung-ho. <laughs> and then I found out that you still have to go through the academy to work with probationaries. So they changed it. So now you had to still have a post certificate, which is the police officer training, which again, 
would not work well because of my lower back injury. <laughs> so talking to one of my professors that I had um, for the last class, which is the most difficult class in the criminal justice program is criminal justice statistics. The passing rate of that class is about 74% which in that college area was very low. I ended up with a 99% in the class and I would teach other people, other students, how to pass, how to do the, yeah, well, how to pass it. So one gentleman in the class was um, ex-Army. He did 24 years in the Army, got out, came back to school because he wanted to get his degree and then go into law enforcement. This was his third time taking the class. And at university level, you can only take a class three times before it's considered a felon. And so this was his last chance to graduate with his degree. When I found out that first day of class, I'm like, you're meeting with me every day after class and we're gonna make sure you pass this class. <laughs> so half of it, how the class was set up is you had homework every week. So we started a study group right after class. And of course, most of the criminal justice classes are all night classes because most of us are also working full time during the day. So we would be in the class until 10, 11 o'clock every night. We worked on the homework as a group. So your grade was split into three, homework, midterm, and your final. Midterm came along. I offered to the whole class that I was gonna do a study session in the library. Anybody who wanted to show up, we're just going to go through everything. The first midterm, or the midterm came around, about six, seven people showed up. Everyone who showed up got an 85 or higher on the midterm, which the teacher was ecstatic, including this gentleman who was this third time taking the class. Rest of the semester goes on, come up to the final. So I offer again to the whole class. I'm gonna do a study session at the library three hours before the final. We had a class of 35 students. 32 showed up. I had four tables all the way across, six movable whiteboards, and we were running back and forth every question you could think of that would have been on that final, anything that they had. One of my other professors came in and was like, are you teaching a class or what is going on? <laughs> and we explained, and it was well known throughout the department that this was the hardest class, so it worked out. Um, we went and took that final that night. I was, of course, one of the first ones done. My professor was like, do you want me to grade it right now? I'm like, sure, why not? You know, she goes through, she grades it. She calls me back up and she looks at me and she's like, I'm disappointed. And I'm like, oh crap, what did I do? She's like, you missed one point. I'm like, God. <laughs> I moved the decimal one too many times. <laughs> it's like, all right. Um, because I was curious to see if my friend had passed the class, I sat outside the classroom for the whole two hours and 45 minutes that the test was being taken because he was the last one and he wanted to make sure everything got done right. So finally, my professor and him come out and they look at me and he's like, I'm passing with an 87, I get to graduate. <laughs> and now he is actually a police officer for Riverside County. So I am very proud of him. Um, his name is Marcus, but great, great man. Um, after that, talking to that professor, she is the one who actually convinced me to go into the master's program. Because she's like, if you don't want to do, if you're not able to do the law enforcement, why don't you go into the other side, go into the public administration, and then work alongside the law enforcement. And so that's what I did. I started the MPA program at Dominguez Hills. Um, they had two options. They had a online version, which was two years. And they had a in person, which was three years. Me knowing me, I could not do online because I hate online. Um, being a tech person, I hate most technology stuff anyway. 
Um, so I did the in person. So that was three years, and in March, May of 2020, I graduated with my master's in public administration. At that time, Priscilla and I had planned to get married that July, and then I could get a job and move up. Well, before that hit, before that all happened, COVID. <laughs> and things went all haywire. So I ended up graduating. We had to postpone the wedding, but I was still working down here. I was starting to apply up there, but nobody was hiring because everybody was letting people go at the time because of it. So we ran into issues. But I'll explain in a few more minutes about that. So my work life while I was in college, um, I worked for the city of Florence. Um, I actually started in high school working there as a locker room attendant for the Torrance Plunge. I don't believe that job should ever be permitted to 15 year olds to sit in a locker room at a pool. Not something you want to ever do. <laughs> so I started there and then my brother also worked for the city. And when he went off to trade school, I was actually able to take his position at STARS. And STARS is a program, it's an after school program for special need youth. So the city would bus kids from the Torrance schools to our facility, and we would take care of them from uh, two o'clock to 6 p.m. after school. Um, we had kids varying from very high functioning to very, very low function. Um, there were very tough days and there were days that were great. Um, hate to say it, but more tough than great days, but that happens. So the STARS program also does a community outreach for the special needs and offers a monthly dance. So we used to have to work with that as well, which was great because you got to meet all the rest of the members in the community who have special needs. On top of the dances, they would also do monthly bowling. Oh, wow. So I, of course, was asked to lead that because, well, my background in bowling, <laughs> which is, was great and it was fun. Most difficult challenge I ever had is one of the gentlemen loved to bowl was blind. Oh, my God. And he was a bigger guy, and he liked to throw the ball very fast. <laughs> so I used to have to work with him one-on-one -on -one and angle him and make sure he got it down the lane. It was challenging, but you can always tell their joy of getting to be there and getting to participate. Next, I worked at um, oh, the city of Torrance um, ended up actually cutting the funding for our program uh, due to budget cuts and that was in 2013, I believe. It was either 2011 or 2013. Um, so pretty much I ended up out of a job because they just cut the funding and whether you're like pretty much, you could try to find another department that will take you, otherwise, thank you, bye. Um, which working for cities, that happens. So I actually ended up getting a job at Dominguez Elementary School and I got this through a, uh, one of my former scouts. His mom was a teacher at the school and they knew that I did IT stuff and I can work on computers, um, but they did not have an IT position available. They only had a paraprofessional position available, which is a teaching assistant. So I got hired as a TA, but I ran a computer lab, <laughs> is what they did, um, which was great. I had a lot of fun. I was able to upgrade their computer lab, which is where things got bad. I came in and it was like October. My principal came up and said, hey, I need you to look at getting brand new computers for the computer lab. And I'm like, okay, great. Like, what do you want? And she's like, whatever you can find, find it. I'm like, okay. We had a $90,000 grant to pay for this upgrade. So I looked at a couple of different options and presented them to her. One was a remote desktop where there was two computers, two towers that ran everything. 
The other one was all brand new Dells. The principal, after I presented those two, she's like, can you also get a quote from Apple? Because at the time, the school district had the contract with Apple Computers. And I'm like, okay, yeah, no problem. Call Apple and tell them about the school. Their response is, oh, we'll send out somebody to do, talk with your principal. They'll send out an actual representative. And I'm like, okay, if that's what you want to do, can't really argue. So they sent out a representative. That was October. Winter, December 1st comes up, and we're talking about the position. And the principal and a few of the other teachers mentioned, we can do the options that I had presented and hire me on as an IT person. And that was being presented to the principal and to the, uh, can't remember the name of it. It's not the teachers, or not the uh, parent, it's something parents, it's with the parents. Uh, and so that was one option. And the principal told me when we started winter break, we'll let you know when you come back, what we decide. I'm like, great, you know, if I can get the IT position, that'd be great. I can keep, you know, come back after winter break, go in and talk to the principal and ask, so did you guys make a decision? She's like, yep. I'm like, great, what, are you, what was the decision? We're buying the Apple. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean about the IT position? She was like, well, we no longer have the funding because the Apple computers cost $90,000 total. So we ended up getting 33 brand new IMACs for an elementary school. Now, none of the teachers had ever used Apple computers, and the only person on campus who knew how to work them was me. <laughs> and you're telling me that you're not giving me the IT position, but you want to still keep me and run your computer lab with all these new computers. Yeah, that did not settle well. Yeah. Luckily, I was asked that same prior October to run sound for the play Dracula here by Steve Norris. And Steve knew about me because my dad was here running lights for the show. So I started doing that that October. Well, after the show ended, Reverend Mark asked me to come and if I could work every Sunday doing the sound, camera, film editing for the Sunday service. I'm like, yeah, sure, you know, I can do that on Sunday, still work at the school for a little bit, you know, and I'm, it doesn't affect me going to school. So sure, why not? So I did that. And then, by God's hand, I ended up getting full-time here because John Fitzgerald left a bunch of resumes in the computer bag that I had. <laughs> and he called me on a Sunday after church and he's like, hey, there's a bunch of resumes in that computer bag. Can you put them in my office? Sure, you know, I didn't think about it, put the resumes up in his office. Sitting at the school that following Monday, it dawned on me, what were those resumes for? Yeah. Like, the only position I'm aware of is the IT or the AV position that I'm doing. Like, so I called John and I'm like, hey, what is those? He's like, we have a maintenance supervisor position available. Are you interested? Yeah, I'm interested. How fast can you give me a resume? Right now. <laughs> Got on that resume Monday night, had an interview the Thursday night. The following week, I had an interview with the uh, committee. Two weeks after that, I started here. So by the end of January, I was no longer at the school, which I was greatly appreciative. Mm -hmm. One thing I did miss, um, the WW up there stands for Whispering Winds Catholic Retreat Center, which I worked for a summer, um, and that's actually in Julian. So again, commuting has never been <laughs> part of my mindset whatsoever. <laughs> Um, and this is the team that we had that summer, um, and it was run for family camps, which also means I got certified to run a high adventure course, and I'm also certified to run the zip line. Big wire that you go riding across town or mm -hmm. stuff. I am certified to run it. I have never been on it, and I will never be on it. <laughs> <laughs> 
because I helped the guy replace the cables on the thing, I will never get one of those. <laughs> so now we come to what everybody actually wanted to hear about anyway. <laughs> After college, I moved to the Central Valley. So two years ago, um, my parents, well, actually it was four years ago, my parents decided to retire, I guess it's this thing that you guys do, uh, <laughs> and they moved to Prescott Valley, Arizona, which then meant me and my brother had to figure out how to cover our mortgage payment over in Torrance. Well, about a year later, my brother's like, I'm not doing that, I'm out, and he moved to Texas. And, well, I'm stuck with a mortgage payment in Torrance, and I don't make that good. <laughs> so, um, I had one year for my master's left at that time. And my parents are like, you know what? We're just gonna sell the house. We'll get you an apartment somewhere, finish your master's. Because at the end of my master's, I was planning to move and be full-time in the Central Valley. So I'm like, great. They sold the house. I moved to an apartment over in Lomita. It was going great. And I proposed to Priscilla. So that was actually 4th of July over here in Manhattan Beach off of 14th Street. Um, and well, I proposed again. I was supposed to get married in July. That did not happen. <laughs> but I eventually did get married to Priscilla last March. And this was us at our wedding. Um, Heck of a day because on top of everything, Priscilla's family owns their own brat shop. So guess who did all the stuff for the wet? <laughs> no, Priscilla was busy getting ready. So me and all my groomsmen were up till midnight the day before and then started back again at 6 a.m. <laughs> and my brother being as crazy as he is, the first thing he did is when we got there at 6 a.m., he's like, all right, we're all taking shots. Oh, okay. <laughs> Granted, it was also 40 degrees outside, so a shot actually looked very nice. <laughs> so, where did you get married at? Yeah. Where did you get married at? Uh, we actually got married at St. Rita's uh, Catholic Church in Tulare. And the reception was actually in my in-laws' backyard because they live on a ranch property. So we converted the backyard into a venue. Um, me and my dad actually built a bar area. Uh, my father-in-law paid, did a huge paved dance floor and maintained it. They put a bunch of, you know, money into this to create this venue, which they've been wanting to do for years, which now we actually rent out for weddings and other events up there, which worked out great. And I'm like, great, our wedding pushed everybody to do it. Sweet. <laughs> it was a lot of work, though. It took quite a while. Well, then we got married, and nine months later, <laughs> Elaine Rose Moretta came to be. Now, the cool thing that actually a lot of people don't know about this, Rose is, her middle name is named after my grandma. Her first name was Rose. Yep. My grandmother would have turned 100 on Thanksgiving this past year, which is the day Ellie was born. Oh. Yeah. So Ellie wasn't supposed to be born until December 5th. Priscilla went in uh, for her checkup the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And the doctor's like, yeah, we're inducing labor tonight. And I was down here working. <laughs> I get a call at three o'clock from Priscilla saying, hey, they're inducing labor at seven. And I'm here in LA on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. I'm like, there is no way I'm getting there at seven o'clock. <laughs> so, <she was, laughs> so she was able to call, they pushed it back till nine o'clock. I got there at 8.55. <laughs> And the next day, Thanksgiving Day, at 1.10 in the afternoon, Ellie was born at seven pounds, 18 inches. Wow. And well, 
healthy delivery, no issues, everything went well. Priscilla was doing did great, nothing, no complications. So we were in the hospital because of COVID, there could only be me and Priscilla. Um, and that had just recently changed because before they weren't allowing anybody. So, so what would be a full nine months or how No, she was eight months and about two weeks. So she was about two weeks early. early. Um, which because it was Priscilla's for the doctor wanted her to go full term, but Priscilla started showing signs of an issue that could affect her. So they induced, that's why they induced labor early. But she was healthy, there was no complications. So it worked out really well. My belief is because my grandma wanted that baby born on her birthday. <laughs> that's why that happened. So she has been slowly, well, not slowly, she has been growing <laughs> rapidly. So <laughs> Priscilla is big on dressing her up, is the thing. <laughs> yeah. So um, she got this blanket made for her, and of course, her and her sister love taking pictures. So they've done a bunch of pictures. Some she would not let me post because she's like, that's ugly, don't do that. And then I'm like, <laughs> so right before Christmas, we decided to take Christmas photos with everybody in the family. So that's my father and my mother. And these are Priscilla's parents, Fabiola and Manuel. And we had a professional photographer come in and we did this actually in their living room, which worked out well because Ellie, a whole two hours, did not have a problem. It was great. She didn't cry. She, we are very blessed. She does not cry a lot. <laughs> she is very quiet. Um, and she actually sleeps, which apparently is not regular. She will go actually seven hours solid sleep, which. I thought she was going fast. Yeah. So, oh. um, my wife, Priscilla, and her sister decided to do a photo shoot, and chaos for dinner, and of course, once they took the sign away, this is what she gave them to look for. And so, Ellie was born in November, well, Priscilla's sister was also pregnant, and she gave birth at the end of January. So we have the two little ones. Which, yeah. Which I can honestly say I'm glad I'm here for the most of the time. Because my sister-in-law's little one is a screamer. If she is not sleeping or eating, she is screaming. And well, she's been at my in-laws house for the past two and a half weeks. <laughs> I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> so that is this part. I do have with <laughs> Kelly. The first grandchild, not on your side. But on yeah, so Ellie is the first grandchild for my uh, in laws, um, Fabiola and Manuel, uh, which they were ecstatic about. And it was funny because when Priscilla was pregnant, Priscilla's mom was like, No, don't, I'm not going to help you. I'm going to help as little as I can because I have other stuff. Yeah, that lasted maybe six hours because the day we came home from the hospital, literally her parents were there that night. <laughs> and ever since they've always they help out whenever they can, um, which works out really well because when I'm living, when I'm down here working, Priscilla can go stay with her parents, um, which works out nice because then she's not alone by over where we live now, which is actually a rented property, and the person that we rent from sits in this room. Right now. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, which was an entire another blessing because Priscilla had moved out, 
And then she was there two months and then they gave her a 30 day notice that she needed to move. And we were like, what happened? And well, the gentleman who owned the house, he had moved out and left his daughter to rent out the house. Well, he moved out because he moved in with his fiance. Well, he was moving back because he was no longer had a fiance. So we had to find a place fast and it was very blessed to find that somebody here in the church actually had property up in the Central Valley. <laughs> Yeah, and then probably not going to play because my computer is old. Oh, this is a computer that my parents got me when I first started college. So yeah, it's 11, it's eleven years old, and I still get it to run somehow. But it does not look like it wants to work. Keep trying. They want to see your yeah. <laughs> 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 No, it's playing. It's just see that blue circle. It doesn't want to load. It's, wondering. it's trying to figure out if it's going to work or not. But I will let that run and hopefully it'll start playing. But in the meantime, does anybody have any questions? Almost. There's one thing I did skip out. Um, <laughs> one, actually, two things I skipped out. One, I was very heavily involved in Boy Scouts. I am an Eagle Scout, along with my brother. Um, my dad was in Scouts when he was young, um, which was interesting because he was in a Mormon Scout trip. Um, yeah, so my best friend, Nathan, that you guys saw a picture of earlier. No, it's not wonderful. Um, he, my best friend's Mormon, and they were in this, the scout trip that my dad was in. Um, I went to an event at the Mormon temple and the bishop there comes and talks to you before it was a dance and they give you all the rules and stuff. And at the end, he was shaking hands and asking for our names and stuff. He gets to me, he shakes his hand, he asks me for me. And I'm like, oh, I'm Jacob Moretta. And he's like, he looks at me, he's like, are you related to a Henry? And I'm like, yeah, that's my father. And he's like, all right, have a nice day. And he went gone. He was gone. <laughs> so I asked my dad this. I'm like, what happened? And he's like, oh, back when I was in Scouts, he was the leader, and they kept trying to convert me into Mormonism. Oh. So I became a better Catholic. <laughs> and would argue with the bishop. <laughs> and that is the second thing. I'm actually Catholic, and I my prior parish was St. Martin Mary's over in Lamina. Uh, which is also where my scout troop was based at. Um, now that I live in the Central Valley, I'm part of St. Rita's up in Tulare, um, which is technically outside of our district, but that's the whole confusing thing. So, yeah, I am a practicing Catholic, um, and so is Priscilla, which was very much a blessing because her being at a Christian college, I would assume that she was just Christian and nope, she was very Catholic actually. So it worked out very well. Um, Ellie will be baptized probably in October is what it's looking like, uh, just because of family trying to get everybody here at one time. <laughs> actually, up there at one time, getting them to LA is a lot easier for some reason. Um, but yeah, that is the two things I actually skipped over. <laughs> And oh, I don't know why this is not oh, right. very interesting. Now. Jacob? Yeah. What kind of job are you looking for? Oh, kid? Yeah. <laughs> um, as you guys are well aware, once I graduated, I've uh, been applying for jobs up in the Central Valley. Um, 
I applied for about everything. I've sent out over 50 applications. Wow. Um, working in either criminal justice at prisons, public administration, uh, maintenance, pretty much anything in the public field. I'm trying to get in with the city, county, school districts, anything public field. Um, some of the jobs I've applied to were IT techs, uh, analyst positions for criminal justice or business analysts. Um, one was a probationary uh, instructor, which they wanted somebody who can teach multiple trades to probationaries so that they can actually have skills to carry on. Um, so that, um, <laughs> Building maintenance. So I have applied all over the place and I am still waiting. <laughs> so um, Priscilla works for Visalia Unified School District. So I applied there for multiple positions, but anybody who's worked with school districts know that they move so fast when it comes to hiring. And I've had applications that have been sitting there for almost six months and still haven't heard anything back, but it's still running. So it's like, okay, your guys' is HR is great. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so I'm still currently looking. Um, I've had a few potential interviews, so things are moving. I just don't know if they're gonna move as fast as I would like, but. <laughs> Yeah. From Jacob. Yeah. Fresno is what fifty miles away. Yeah, Fresno is fifty. Uh, it's about forty-four. Actually, it's forty-four from our house. Uh, <laughs> I've applied. I've yeah, applied. Yeah. So I've applied. <laughs> um, anybody who knows uh, Pat and Phil Markson live in Dinuba. They bought a house, so I've applied there. I applied Fresno, Selma, Portersville, Bakersfield, Kings County, Tulare County, Fresno County. Yeah, um, every school district in the area, Fresno, Visalia, Tulare, Joint Union, Color Rossi, uh, Farmersville, Exeter, I've applied pretty much every small town, big town in the Central Valley that's within a 50 mile radius. And I'm still waiting. Now, one thing I have realized um, up there, it happens down here too. A lot of positions I do, I have gone past over for, and I believe that I was beyond qualified, but I didn't know anybody in the city or in the school district or anything like that. Um, specifically, one position I applied for was for Visalia Unified School District as a theater technician. So literally running lights, sounds, you know, everything around live theater. I've been doing that since I was two years old. <laughs> My father owned his own lighting and design company for live theater. I've been around stages, I've been around, I took over my dad's lighting company and I have all the lighting equipment. They passed me over. Why? I don't know. I had the interview, I, I was, did good, felt great. Came back and said, nope, they hired somebody else. And I'm sitting there like, yeah, I have all this. Who's more qualified than me? And the answer is somebody who knows somebody. <laughs> it's, uh, it's what happens. Why don't you, because you picked up the public sector, why don't you turn not restricted at all? I have not. I have also looked into the private sector as well, but. Most of my skills will not transfer to private sector, especially the technical skills, which is what mainly the Central Valley is. A lot of the Central Valley is blue collar jobs. Um, mostly agriculture, huge amount is agriculture, but then there's also all the trades. Now the problem is getting hired with a trade company. I am not certified in any of the trades. I am not a certified electrician, I'm not a certified plumber. I'm not certified to work on HVACs. Just because I can and I know what I'm doing and everything, they won't hire me because I don't have that piece of paper saying I'm certified. 
So the way around that <laughs> I have found is apply for building maintenance positions for county school districts and everywhere else because they do not want you to be certified. <laughs> they want you to be able to do whatever the heck they ask you to do. <laughs> so I have multiple positions and those are the positions I was talking about that I've had a couple interviews. So I'm now waiting to hear back and see if something comes through. Yep, exactly. And I'm hoping it will soon because honestly, before, so I've been, <laughs> been driving back and forth for almost two years now. Um, luckily I have an aunt who lives in Torrance, so I have a place to stay when I'm down here. For the first you know, year and a half was no big deal. Driving back and forth, okay, no big deal. Once Ellie was born, that all changed. And I'm down here usually four, if not five days a week. I get back home and I swear she's grown another like two inches. And it's like, all right, this is killing me being away from my daughter. So I'm really hoping that something comes through soon because I just want to be, I want to be home with my family. So yeah. <laughs> Apply for college of the Sequoias. <laughs> I did apply for college of the Sequoias. Um, they have a weird, weird hiring thing. <laughs> no, it's, I have the degrees to teach, but they want you to have the field experience. So, well, you have so many experience and so many things. I, I do, but because my degree is in public administration. None of my actual experiences in the public field. It's no offense, but well, here nonprofit <laughs> and doing building maintenance, not the actual public administration side. So a lot of the jobs that I've looked at there, they want somebody who can do you know cover accounting, cover uh, budgets for large entities, cover human resource management, and have experience with that. Because yeah, so that's what my actual MPA was specialized. It was Master of Public Administration with an emphasis in human resource management. So I have the education, but I don't have the actual field experience, which is what. Hey, well, sort of somebody freshly graduate have with the paper and everything. The experience is a lot more that is valuable true. than a piece of paper. Yeah. Hey, Jacob, what about getting an emergency credential to get substitute teachers due to lack of teaching? That is something I've looked at. Um, but they are now. They are now because they're, they're hurting for teachers, yeah. especially up there. Uh, I got paying 220 a day with my daughter did. It was 120 a day. We, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've considered it, but I really, the other thing is right now, uh, I'm going to be turning 30 next year. And I really want to start my career in the public field. I want to find somewhere where I can actually grow my career. Because recently, not recently, as you can tell in the past several years, I've been jumping from job to job, ones that don't have much growth opportunity. So I'm trying to get in with a county or somewhere like that so I can actually start moving up and building that reward. So you've already hired you know, your replacement. Nick? Yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. So uh, here at the church, I actually hold two different job titles. So I hold the AV technician and I also hold the maintenance supervisor technician. So uh, yes, the church has uh, hired Nick Grulitz, uh to run the AV side, um, which also means because he is now hired, um, I will actually be losing hours. So starting in April, I go down to 20 hours, um, which means I will probably only be here two, two days a week. So, but again, hoping a job comes through up there. Well, that I'm question be, what skill will not be replaced by Nick? What, what, what do you do that Nick, Nick can't do? That Nick can't do? Yeah, exactly. uh, nothing. <laughs> so, um, Nick. <laughs> I've known Nick since he was here. Um, he is also one of my former scouts. 
and he was he, really young. Is he in twenties or what? Yeah, he's got two older brothers, uh, Eddie and Matthew. Um, Eddie's two years younger than me. Matthew's four, next six. So I've been sort of Nick's mentor all the way up. Um, he is also Catholic like me. I taught him confirmation. I helped him get his Eagle Scouts and Boy Scouts. He took my job at Whispering Winds when I started here. <laughs> so, and now he's taking over my AV position here as I'm hoping to move on. Um, so everything that I currently do, Nick can do without a problem. Um, the only thing that I am better at than Nick is, is the video editing. And that's because I have all the years from high school and everything else I did afterwards that makes, I think that I can edit way better. But anybody who was at the annual meeting and saw the slideshow, that was actually Nick. Nick did all the slideshow this year. I did not do anything except for go through and fix stuff at the very end. And that's because I wanted to make sure he could do it. Um, the skill sets that are going to be lost is the maintenance stuff when I leave. Um, but again, also, if the church wants or if not, whatever, Nick is actually getting his master's degree in mechanical engineering. So any of the maintenance stuff I do, Nick could probably do better than I can. <laughs> um, and he's actually, so his dad is a civil engineer for uh, city of LA and they built their own house, couple houses. So Nick is probably more proficient at building maintenance than I even am. <laughs> Don't tell him I said that. Uh, <laughs> but even, though, even if I do leave or when I do leave, none of the skills will be lost. Um, now, will he have to pick up on certain things and learn a lot faster? And yes, but anybody who starts a new position is in that same situation. So, um, yeah, the only skills that will actually be lost is probably the lighting designs <laughs> for the shows. And that's because I've done that my whole life. That's the only the only thing that I know that it doesn't know that I do. And that's doing a lighting design for a show is more of an art skill than. Well, when you're doing when you were doing that, Nick didn't even warn you. Yeah. It's all right. That, that's because my dad. My dad has been in live theater since he was at Bishop Montgomery over in Torrance. After he graduated, they did a traveling theater group for like six years, going up and down the entire Western Coast. So, which actually was funny because they found a picture the other day of the group and he put it up on the screen. And he was like, which one's me? And I'm like, I know. Like, <laughs> yeah. He's like, that one's me. And I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> you must be mistaken. That doesn't look like you. So. That's not the way I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, any other questions? Thank you so much. All right.